Grace and peace to you on this, the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany. You just saw the announcement scroll, but I have a few details to give you. One of the things we probably have, haven't explained as well as we should have is how Mission Madness is working this year. Mission Madness, we're collecting all kinds of things that you can bring to support the teachers at Bailiwick and our preschool, that you can support immigration ministry, that you can support Family Promise, so things like pillows and food and office supplies, and it's just, it's a drop-off event. There are a couple of ways that you can also uh, Give us the fruits of your labors. You can help us to do some gardening, and I believe there's still some spots to help paint sections of a mural for Bailiwick. So I encourage you to click on Mission Madness on our website, and there's a sign-up genius, and it will tell you all the ways that you can be a part of it. And this is coming up on February the 13th. Another mission that you can be a part of is Warmth for Wake, and this is hosted by United Methodist Men. So this is for the men in our church and their uh, youth who are over the age of 14 who might want to help be a part of that project. And that project is on February 20th. So still some spots for that. Think about signing up for that one. And finally, we are preparing for Lent, and we have these bags that are made up that will help you to participate more fully on Ash Wednesday and on the six Sundays throughout Lent. And so try to stop by the church, pick up a Lent at home bag, or if you're in a small group, maybe you would be kind enough to pick them up for your whole small group and, and make that your own mission to serve those to the others in your group. So lots and lots going on. And this morning, now we just take a moment to pause, to relax, and to center our hearts and our minds for worship.
Please join me in our opening prayer. God of all power, you are the one who called this world into being, and we acknowledge that you have no equal in the extent of your power. Yet you want to share your power, your strength, with those who are powerless. You ache to heal the brokenhearted and to bind up the wounds of the lost and rejected of this world. Such radical love leaves us speechless, but you gave it human form and shape in the person of Jesus, in whom your promises of healing and empowerment were fulfilled. We give you thanks and praise for blessing our lives in this way, and we pray that in Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we too can become radical lovers of the powerless and passionate bearers of hope to those whose lives are filled with despair and hopelessness. May this time of worship be a true expression of our desire to praise and glorify you, O God, for the many ways in which you bless us. And may our lives reveal our gratitude in all we think and do and say. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. scripture reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed, and Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, 
Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning and welcome to Children's Time. I brought something with me today, and it is a Band-Aid. And I wonder if you have ever needed a Band-Aid. You got hurt, and you had to put a Band-Aid over to cover up where it hurt, to let it start to heal and get better. But sometimes the best thing about a Band-Aid isn't just that it helps you heal. Sometimes the best thing about a Band-Aid is whoever puts it on who helps you put the Band-Aid on, especially, this is a pretty small one. I will open this up here, and this is one that could like go on your finger or something. It would be really difficult for me to, it's difficult for me to get this out of the package. It'd be really difficult for me to get this little bitty Band-Aid and put it on my finger. So I would need some help to do that. And sometimes that's the very best thing as somebody who can put that Band-Aid on and you know that they want you to feel better they want to help you in our bible story today jesus made somebody feel better he didn't put a band-aid on her but he made her sickness go away to show how much he loved her and she jumped right up and started helping to show how much she loved him she wanted to jump into what jesus was doing And so sometimes the best thing is being healed, and sometimes the best thing is knowing about the people who love us, even when things hurt. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for healing us, to help us feel better. But thank you for the people also who help us feel better, the people who share their love with us, the people who share your love with us. Help us jump up and join what you're doing and help us share your love and your healing to all those around us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, speak with authority in our lives. Speak to us and to what is in us that we might be whole. Speak to us with love that we might hear you and know you and deep inside know that we are your people and that you are our God. Amen. Valentine's Day is next Sunday. So let this serve as a timely reminder to you if there's someone in your life who is expecting you to take pen to paper. But when you do it, I encourage you not to follow the example of this man, Ralph, that I read about. He lived in Great Britain uh, probably a century ago, and he wrote this little gem to his friend Margaret Stewart Wortley. He was pleading for her affection, and he ended saying, If you find yourself unwilling to accept me, would you please pass this letter to your sister Caroline? Not surprisingly, neither Margaret nor Caroline accepted his kind offer, although their older sister Mary did. In general, we value being seen as an individual, not as some interchangeable part on an assembly line. We will always hold something that's handwritten with our name on it, even if it's something scrawled on a post-it note with a lot higher regard than we would an email that arrives addressed to dear sir or madam. And yet it's all too common to go for months and months without really feeling special to anyone at all. Last year, 31,000 people applied to NC State University's undergraduate program. And only 44% of them were were accepted, which means the other 56% received that letter of rejection and had to deal with that letdown of feeling anonymous or feeling not seen. 
And then the ones that were accepted ended up studying at home, back in their hometown bedrooms, where they really didn't even have those connections with their high school teachers and their coaches that they had had before. And so they went from that high, high of being accepted to that low, low of being back where they started, or even worse than that, feeling anonymous to everyone. There's a lecturer at the Harvard School of Public Health, and he lectures on loneliness. That's his specialty. And he writes about these three different kinds of loneliness that are prevalent today. And one of them is probably the one that you know the most. It's interpersonal loneliness. That's when you, uh, you ask, gosh, I've, I've got really good news. I want to share it with someone. Do I have even one person that I could call who would be excited to hear this? That's the kind of loneliness we, t- we typically hear about. And then there's a second kind of loneliness, and this is societal loneliness. And this is when someone walks into a room and they're asking, is there anyone here who is going to be excited to see me, who will anticipate my coming and will welcome me? They're not really looking for a, one particular person, but they're just saying, is my being acceptable to other people? And sometimes it isn't. Sometimes if you don't live up to society's measure of what it means to be beautiful or intellectual or whatever it is, you vote for the right person or you cheer for the right basketball team, you can go into a room and feel lonely if you don't fit in. But this third kind, this third kind is the hardest kind. It's, it's the one that's probably the hardest to overcome. And it's an, an existential loneliness. Existential loneliness is when you turn and you say, do I matter at all? What is my place in the universe? Do I have a mission or a purpose or a weight to my very existence in life? Those NC State students, this is the one that they're known to feel the most uh, in, in, in the highest degree. 18 to 24-year-olds have the highest rates of loneliness of any age group in the nation. But of course, any of us can ask that question. Does my life matter? Existential loneliness is exacerbated when we're asking that question of God. God, does my life matter to you? It's hard to believe sometimes that the God of the cosmos cares about whether or not we can make our car payment. Or does the God who created heaven and earth care about my excitement over my new herb garden? Or does this God who has this ultimate plan for a new heaven and a new earth really count on anything that happens in the web of neighborhoods that make up North Raleigh? God, does my life matter? For the last three weeks, we've been walking through this one day in the life of Jesus. One day, his first day in public ministry after he came out of the desert. And on this day, we know that he walked along the shores of the Galilee early in the morning. And he recruited James and John and Simon and Andrew, and he made them be fishers of men and net menders. And then a little bit later on, he went to the synagogue. And I want to show you a picture of it. Um, You'll see it here. And in this picture, you'll see that it's been uh, renovated a few times, but that's, that's the synagogue. That's where he was in Capernaum. And while he preached there, he exercised his authority over evil by exercising a demon from a man who had walked in. And now, today, it's supper time. He's had this long day, and so Simon invites him home for dinner. And Simon's mother-in-law, she scurries around, and she puts bread on the table, and she refills the wine and gives her guests all that they need to have the strength to face the fishmongers and the bakers and the shoemakers and all the people, the hordes of people that are gathering outside her window for healing. 
you know, we hear about these crowds. We've had crowds gathering for all sorts of reasons all through the last year. And typically, they're shown to us as if they're an amoeba, you know, just this group of people who all have the same convictions and the same hearts and the same minds. We seldom get their individual stories. And sometimes that happens in Scripture, too. Sometimes there's crowds, the the 5,000 who came to eat. But sometimes the gospel writers stop, and they give us a little bit more. And that's what Mark does here. He tells us that just before dinner, just before those crowds showed up, Jesus performed one other healing. Simon's mother-in-law had been sick in bed with a fever until Jesus held her hand and raised her up and healed her. You wouldn't expect, really, this little bit of local color, this, this little interlude of healing. It's just a little unassuming two-verse miracle, hardly uh, big enough to make it into a gospel where Jesus will heal people who are blind and hemorrhaging or who are paralyzed or who are disabled. It's, it's interesting that Mark throws in this little story of a woman with a fever. Not only Mark does it, three of the Gospels do it. We hear it three times. It's it's so inconsequential that Luke will take it, and instead of saying Jesus healed a fever, he'll say Jesus healed a great fever. He's going to embellish it. He's going to build it up. It's as if a fever isn't quite noteworthy enough, so let me throw an extra adjective into the sentence. You know, sometimes scriptural passages are symbolic. Sometimes they have some hidden meaning. But Simon Peter's mother-in-law is not a symbol. She's not a type. She's not a concept. She's an actual woman. She doesn't stand for anything. She is Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And we'll also show you uh, the picture of the house where she lives. You can still visit it today. As you look at this picture, some of this was added on to later, but that's the house. That's where they were. Fever is not a generic term. It's not a, a catch-all. It's an actual thing that happened. When you hear that she had a fever, maybe it was typhoid, maybe it was malaria. Both of those were prevalent in that day. But to say that she had a fever meant that this woman laid on a couch or some type of mat on a hot Palestinian day, probably wishing that the fish processing plant across the village would just stop for one day, that the heat in her head would just be gone because she lay there feeling wretched. And Jesus goes to her and raises her up, and he heals her. Does God care about my hurts? Does God know that I exist? This woman's story answers the question of our existential loneliness. On his first day in ministry, God incarnate in Jesus Christ reaches out and heals this woman with a fever. Plenty of people groan at this next part. Because do you remember what she does once she's healed? She jumps up and she begins to serve the disciple. Diakoneo, the Greeks say, to serve. And it seems to sort of press on those bruises we have, those gender stereotype bruises that, you know, Lazarus didn't get up and start serving people dinner when he was raised from the dead. But this woman gets up and she serves. You think, couldn't the disciples make their own sandwiches just this once? Yet, if we wish away her service, we're wishing away the point of this whole story. I bet you can name someone that God has healed, and their response has been to come into the church and to serve. I think of my friend Richard, who came to me early on in my ministry, and he had been delivered by God from his addiction 
and his alcoholism. And he came and sat in my office and looked at me and said, Mitzi, if anyone ever comes in and they're strung out or they're drunk or they're at the end of their tether and they need help, I am five minutes away. Call me. And if they're ready, I will come and sit with them. Diakoneo, to serve. Or I think of my friend Tanya, whose husband was um, known throughout our town. And then he was, he died. Decades too young. And God, over time, delivered Tanya from her grief. And so then she added to that identity as widow, an identity of leader of our grief support group, diakoneo, to serve. If you're asking, do I fit into the universe, what you're really asking for is to be healed, to be restored to community, to feel as if you don't matter, is to long for a healing, to long to be part of this world that God created. You want to be missed? You want to be noticed when you're not there? And Jesus' healing always has restoration to the community as its ultimate purpose. Simon's mother-in-law, she's a woman who lives to serve. That's her, that is her purpose. That's her love language, to use our modern terms. We know this because Simon doesn't have any qualms about bringing four people home for dinner unannounced. When, when they get there, um, they expect to be fed. And you can almost imagine you know, earlier that morning, Simon's mother-in-law maybe making his lunch and tucking a little piece of extra bread into it because we all know fishing makes us starving. Diakoneo to serve, that is what gives her purpose. And if you skip ahead 10 chapters, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and that's when we discover that it's not just the 12 men who are covered in the dust of his sandals, but there's this group of women off in the distance. And when the disciples have deserted him after his arrest, the women stand and watch the crucifixion. We're told Um, that they watch from a distance. And we don't know their names, but what we do know about them is that the Scripture tells us that they were the ones who provided for him when he was in the Galilee. Provided for. Diakoneo. And we wonder, was one of those women Peter's mother-in-law? If she's among them, she's more than a chief cook and bottle washer. She's a follower. And if she's a follower, then she is lugging bottles and she, or lugging jars and she's filling glasses of wine and she is soothing those who are sick. She's asking questions like, has everyone been served? Does everyone have enough to eat? Are there any beggars outside the gates? Bring them in. And if she's that kind of follower, then she's a disciple. And if she's a disciple, then Mark tells us, that she has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. What seems like a two-verse footnote is a story about the miraculous particularity of the gospel. If God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son, this world that God loves is made up of unique individual people like you and like me. We're not abstractions or concepts or types. We have individual needs. You have needs. You have needs of loneliness, needs to be delivered from grief, to be delivered from addiction or cancer or heart disease or depression. And as long as any one of us is sick in that way, then we're cut off from the community. And God, his will is not that any one of us on earth would be cut off. Until we're restored to wholeness, the kingdom has not yet come. God isn't like Ralph. He's not going to write that note that says, well, I don't care who you marry. If it's Margaret or Caroline or Mary, you're all the same. 
God isn't interested in creating a new heaven and a new earth for nameless, faceless, abstract people. God wants restoration. So Jesus heals in the synagogue, and he heals in the home, and he heals in the public square, and he heals men, and he heals women, and he heals all sorts of maladies and all sorts of environments for all sorts of people. None are left out. None are substituted. All are cherished. Simon Peter's mother-in-law is a testament when she's healed of her fever to God's particular love for each and every person. Perhaps you're thinking, that's great for Simon Peter's mother-in-law, but what about my own mother-in-law? What about my sister? What about my own sickness? Why doesn't Jesus reach out and touch them? Well, if you've been healed, Jesus is calling you to serve. Diakoneo, you have a role in bringing other people into community. It might mean in prayer. It might mean a casserole. It might be holding their hand as they near their last breath. But you're bringing them into community. Everyone's looking for you, the disciples said to Jesus. Jesus responded, each will be met. For he is the same Lord who knit us together in our mother's womb. And he is the same one who knows us as intimately as we know ourselves. All honor and glory is his, now and forever. Amen.
come to a time of prayers for the people, and I'd like to lift up for you two particular concerns. Allison Monroe uh, needs our prayers upon the death of her father, Frank Sulks. We also pray for Wendy Bishler upon the death of her mother, Linda Lehman, who used to sing with us in the choir here at Soapstone. And for both of these, we wish um, comfort and grace in God's name. Let us pray. Lord, Simon Peter said everyone was looking for you as you spread your message across the Galilee. Whole towns flock to you with their sick and tow, and now we, Lord, we clamor to find you on this day. Lord, heal us. Take our hand and lift us up. Lord, you give new strength to the faint and power to the powerless. Empower us, your church, to restore to wholeness those who lack resources. We ask you to bless our collection of food and office supplies and pillows and tokens of encouragement for all of these missions that we have named here today. Bless the work of United Methodist Men as they prepare to do a mission that will bring warmth to those in need of of warmth and of safety. We pray for leaders at every level. May they use their power so that the poor are protected and the weak are upheld. We pray for all who suffer in body, mind, of spirit, for those who are losing mobility, for those who lose memory, for those who have are now lack for an ability to trust or to believe that they are special and seen by someone. Lord, for any who are feeling the difficulties of life in this moment, or who feel neglected, we pray that you will surround them with comfort, and mostly that you will lead us to surround them as a community of care. And we now lift up these silent prayers that are written on our hearts. Lord, comfort those who grieve, especially Allison and the family of Linda Lehman. Help us in our own small way to be more like your compassionate Christ. Shape our thoughts and our feelings that we may serve and that we may give our very best to each day. And now we pray in the name, in, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Gretchen Shea has uh, talked with Dana Tiller, and she's going to pass the piece to us with a story of healing and restoration. Good morning, Dana. Thank you for joining us this morning. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Uh, Mitzi has uh, talked this morning about a story of healing, and I know that you have a story of healing, and I was hoping you would share a little bit about that with us this morning. Absolutely, we'd be happy to. Um, Back in October 2013, I was diagnosed with um, stage 3B ovarian cancer. Um, Before that, I was, um, I don't want to say diagnosed, but I uh, found out that I was BRCA positive, which is the mutation 
um, that predisposes you to uh, breast and ovarian cancer. Um, I was able to do some preventative uh, measures, but I was also um, I was also doing uh, surveillance to make sure things were okay. And during one of those doctor's visits, I uh, found out that something looked sort of wrong. So I went in um, for surgery. And uh, when I came out, I was told that I had stage 3B ovarian cancer. Um, after that, I went through chemotherapy for about six weeks, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and um, everything was going well uh, for a few years. And then in 2017, um, August, September timeframe, I was diagnosed with a reoccurrence. I then had surgery again and went through um, uh, chemotherapy again for another six, six weeks or a little bit more. Um, and now here we are, things are still going well. I go to the doctor every three months um, and just to uh, make sure things are still going well. I'm on some um, maintenance medicine um, to help with, with things not coming back as well. So, um, so yeah, that's where we are today. And can you tell us um, through this illness, how has your faith been impacted? Um, a, a story I like to tell around my faith um, is when I was first diagnosed, one of the things I had, as everyone should <laughs> or does, uh, when they're told they have cancer, there's uh, anxiety that um, comes about. And that's one of the worst things you can have when you're trying to recuperate from surgery and, um, and cancer and everything. So, um, I, I said, God, this, this is yours. I'm giving it to you. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. And, um, I know you have me in that you'll, um, you'll get, get me through this. And from that point on, I, my anxiety was gone. I had very little anxiety at all, um, as I was going through the process. Um, so I really feel that that part of my faith, um, helped me get through the healing process and, um, and come out on the other side with a positive, um, outcome. Um, not only was it my faith though, that got me through it, um, the faith around us, um, around my family and those that are surrounded, um, were surrounded by uh, their faith and their praying for me uh, was just as meaningful and needed as my faith was at the time. Um, do you do you think the healing of this has um, called you into any areas of ministry, or has God used that to nudge you in any way um, into service? Um, I don't know that it has put me into any different direction, but it did, um, kind of set it in concrete <laughs> that, um, I've always liked to help folks in, in any way possible. Um, but it's, this has given me the opportunity to help other folks get through a journey the same as I have. Uh, if, a lot of people, I get questions about how was chemotherapy? How, how did you get through it? What are your tips and tricks and, and those kind of things. And even if it's just to listen and say, yes, I totally understand what you're going through. Um, and being able to uh, be in that community to help others um, get through the same sort of diagnosis. That's oh, uh, definitely a, a wonderful calling. Um, do you, you mentioned the, the folks surrounding you with prayer. Um, how do you, can you say a little bit more about that? Say a little bit more about how the church community um, supported you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was, it was amazing, actually. Um, people praying for me, people uh, bringing us meals. Uh, Alex was five at the time when I was diagnosed. So I was, um, you know, uh, trying to um, take care of a five-year-old. Um, I was, uh, John was working full-time. I wasn't working at the time, which was good, but um, just everyone around me um, lifted me up and um, was able to help me through, whether it was going 
to chemo with me, giving me, giving us meals. Um, but the only tears that I ever shed really pretty much through this whole thing was because of the outpouring of help and love that we received. I'm not one, or I wasn't, didn't used to be one that um, asked for a lot of help and didn't think I needed it. I could do it on my own or we could do it on our own. And um, it was very overwhelming with uh, what everybody did. Um, Tammy Parade dropped gifts at my um, at my door and decorated my uh, mailbox for the different holidays. And those little things like that are amazing. And um, they help lift your spirits and help you get through sort of some dark times. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot more you could say about the story, um, but I appreciate the time that you have given us this morning. And um, we are so glad that you are in a good and healthy place right now um, and that you share your faith with us. Um, I know it has impacted me, so I appreciate it very much. Um, thank, thank you, and have a great day. Thank you, you too. We come to that time in our service where we uh, give thanks to God for all that God does for us and through us by returning to God, God's tithes and our offerings and our very selves. And so let us pray a prayer of thanksgiving for our offerings. Let's pray. Lord, you bless us to be a blessing, and you heal us to heal others. Receive your tithes and our offerings that these gifts and our lives can be used in service to your holy name. Amen.
Now receive this benediction. May you go knowing that your name is written on the palm of God's hand. May your hearts be healed. May the witness of Jesus inspire you to serve. And may God's peace dwell in you. Amen.